Welcome back everybody to another reaction video. So we're truly on the home stretch now with our Epic History TV series on the Napoleonic Wars. This is the second to last video. This is Napoleon Endgame, France 1814, which is covering essentially Napoleon's last stand against the coalition after his defeat at Leipzig. So a couple of things as always before we start. If you like what I do here, please leave a like and a comment. Also, please make sure you subscribe to the channel. There's reaction content every Wednesday and Friday. And um, please be advised these are recorded ahead of time, sometimes weeks in advance. So if you do suggest a video that you want me to look at, I will get to it eventually. It just may take some time to actually appear in the schedule, but um, it will be in there somewhere. Um, if you want to support my channel a bit more, then please consider checking out my Patreon because the more people I get on there, the more content I'll be able to create, particularly original stuff, because the reason I do these is because they take minimal um, effort in the editing department. I don't mind editing, but editing is just something that's very laborious for me. I kind of like lose concentration pretty quickly with it. So um, original content tends to take a bit longer because of the amount of editing required. So, um, but the more uh, people that I get supporting me on Patreon, the more um, sort of financial viability I'll have to create more original content because obviously at the minute, a lot of my time goes to elsewhere including my actual job so uh, if I can turn this into a job then that would be fantastic so um, please consider supporting my channel on there to check out the link in the description and um, there'll also be links to Epic History TV and the original video in the description too so please go check them out and give them some love because they deserve all the love and support that they can from the YouTube uh, community particularly the history community because the work they do is just absolutely incredible and this series has been just fantastic so um but without further ado let's get straight into this this is another pretty long video 33 minutes so my reaction may be a fair bit longer my last video clocked in in about an hour so um you know we might get some um a lot of juicy meaty content out of this but we'll see um how much i have to talk about so but let's just dive straight in so this is napoleon endgame france 1814 In October 1813, Napoleon had suffered his heaviest ever defeat at Leipzig, the Battle of the Nations. Surviving French forces, exhausted, sick and demoralised, retreated to the River Rhine and prepared to defend France from invasion. But in November, the armies of the Sixth Coalition paused their advance, and Austrian Foreign Minister Metternich offered peace terms. The Frankfurt proposals would allow Napoleon to keep his throne if France returned to her so-called natural frontiers. It was the best offer Napoleon was likely to get, now that his back was to the wall, and all Europe's great powers were united against him. Even so, he did not accept the terms, he merely agreed to reopen negotiations. To the Allies, and many in France itself, it proved that Napoleon would not listen to reason. The war went on. That's actually a pretty shrewd move as well, because whether um, the Austrians were ever sincere in that offer of peace, um, a lot of these times, offers of peace, they're not often wholly genuine in the sense that um, it's more of a diplomatic test, in a sense. You know, it's a way to say, well, look, we tried. You know, they just didn't listen. You know, they just, you know, we offered them generous terms and yet they still continued. You know, they, they refused to listen to reason. They can't be negotiated with. We need to end this militarily. So sometimes, you know, these offers of peace, they're not strictly... Um, offered in the sense that they're hoping that they'll be accepted, you know, because I think at this point they must have known that Napoleon would not accept peace on the, on pretty much any terms that would um, cost France any of its territories that, um, that it had conquered. So it's more of a diplomatic win to say, well, look, we tried, because then it makes um, Napoleon look like the obstinate one who's refusing to give in, you know, rather than these coalition armies just kind of marauding across into France and, you know, just destroying army after army in their way. Um, this kind of gives them 
diplomatic moral authority, you know, on the on the world stage, because as we've seen very recently with the war in Ukraine, you know, if you lose the political front, if you lose the diplomatic war, that can be uh, catastrophic. Um, you know, just look at Russia now, it's been completely isolated um, from the rest of the world, basically, you know, even nations like China are kind of reticent to render any kind of aid. So, um, that just shows like how important the diplomatic front really is. And by January 1814, Napoleon's situation looked even worse. Many of his besieged garrisons in the east were starved into surrender. Marshal Davout, with 34,000 men in Hamburg, was now besieged. Denmark, one of France's last allies, was invaded by Bernadotte's Swedish army and made to join the coalition. <laughs> I think at this point Denmark's just like, please leave us alone. You know, they've had two attacks on Copenhagen by the Royal Navy to kind of keep them out, you know, from contributing to France's uh, military efforts. And now a Swedish army crosses into their territory and is like, you will join the coalition. <laughs> just have this image of the dangers being like, for the love of God, please leave us out of this. You know, we just kind of wanted peace with France. French troops evacuated the Netherlands, which reasserted its independence after nearly 20 years of French control. In Italy, Eugène's army faced a new enemy. Joachim Murat, King of Naples, now marching north with 30,000 men to honour his new alliance with the Sixth Coalition. In Paris, Napoleon responded to the crisis with a series of extreme measures. Property taxes doubled, state salaries and pensions suspended, 300,000 new conscripts called up from a country already exhausted by 20 years of war. He ordered the release of Pope Pius, under French house arrest for the last five years, to try to shore up his support in Italy. He even agreed to release Fernando, the Bourbon King of Spain, to take up his throne in exchange for peace between France and Spain, a condition that Fernando was in no position to honour. But these concessions were too little, far too late. In January, two coalition armies crossed the Rhine into France. Blücher's army of Silesia and Schwarzenberg's army of Bohemia. Outnumbered French forces in their path could only fall back. On the 25th of January, Napoleon said farewell to his wife and son at the Tuileries Palace before leaving for the front. He would never see either of them again. With just 70,000 men, he faced odds of four to one. Most of his troops were raw conscripts, some without uniforms, many just learning how to hold a musket. I remember one story, I can't remember which marshal it was, but um, there was a an account of um, a soldier, one of these conscripts, had to be trained how to reload a musket in the heat of battle by one of Napoleon's marshals. You know, whether that's true or not, it just show. you know, it's, it serves to kind of exemplify, you know, just how raw these recruits were. You know, if it was just an exaggeration, that still tells us something. You know, it still tells us, it tells us something of the psychology behind um, you know, what these people were seeing, because they're saying, you know, look, these people are so untrained and raw and green that one of them had to be trained how to load a musket in the heat of battle, you know, and that's the thing with um, history in a, you know, in a sort of macro sense, which is that um, people look at things like the Viking sagas, for example, and say, oh, well, you know, they're just embellished, you know, they're not, they're not real history, they're not real accounts, you know, but that doesn't matter because it still tells us something about the people writing them, you know, it still tells us something about them, of what they were like as people and how they viewed the world and how they viewed the events around them. So, you know, just because they might be embellished doesn't mean that they're completely worthless in any way. But, for the first time in years, Napoleon's army was so small that he'd be able to exercise direct command over all its movements. 
the result would be one of the most audacious and brilliant campaigns in history. Imagine Napoleon waging war in the 20th century. His cavalry replaced by armoured vehicles, cannon by attack helicopters, the old guard in heavy tanks, the Emperor with air support. Could you take the lessons of Napoleon and use them to dominate a modern three-dimensional battlefield? War Thunder. The free-to-play online game and our video sponsor gives you that chance. Take command of a tank, aircraft or ship and fight it out across an immersive, combined arms battlefield with realistic physics and battle damage. There are an incredible 1500 plus historically accurate, playable vehicles from 1930s tanks to Cold War jets plus variable realism settings from arcade to simulator. War Thunder is available on PC, PlayStation and Xbox, and is cross-platform between PC and consoles. Use the link in our video description to join the action, and get a special sign-up bonus. Thank you to War Thunder for sponsoring this video. The battle for France would be fought east of Paris, mostly across Champagne, a flat region divided by the rivers Marne and Seine and their tributaries. In late January, fields were dusted with snow and roads quickly turned to mud. Napoleon learned that the coalition armies were widely scattered, with part of Blücher's army near Napoleon's old college at Brienne. The Emperor advanced rapidly, hoping to trap and destroy part of Blücher's army. But after a hard day's fighting that cost both sides 3,000 casualties, Blücher was able to retreat towards Schwarzenberg's army. That evening, Napoleon was nearly skewered by a charging Cossack, saved only by General Gorgo's good shooting. As Napoleon tried to work out the enemy's movements, Blücher, heavily reinforced by Schwarzenberg, made a surprise attack at La Rothière. Allied troops advanced through swirling snow to assault the village, defiantly held by young French conscripts. One was so inexperienced that Marshal Marmont had to personally show him how to load his musket. That's the one I was referencing earlier. Yeah, it was Marmont. I couldn't remember which marshal it was, but um, yeah, so that's what I was talking about earlier, about these troops being so untrained and green that they basically mean having to show how to fight in the middle of a battle. During the battle. By late afternoon, Vreda's Bavarian Corps was falling on Napoleon's flank. Heavily outnumbered, Napoleon had no option but to retreat, having lost 5,000 casualties and 73 guns abandoned in the thick mud. The Allies' frontal attacks meant their losses were greater, but by combining their armies, they defeated Napoleon on French soil for the first time. Believing Napoleon would now retreat towards Paris, the Allies decided to advance along two routes to ease pressure on the roads. Blücher would take a northern route along the Marne. Schwarzenberg would follow the Seine. But dividing their armies again would play right into Napoleon's hands. Remember, that's Napoleon's tactic to begin with. You know, when he's faced with superior numbers, his whole strategy is to split them up and deal with them one at a time, you know, it's defeat in detail. You know, it's a very, well, you know, at this point in, you know, in history at least, it's a very well accepted military maxim that if you're faced with superior numbers, it's a good idea to try and split them up and then you can deal with them one at a time. And here they're just doing that work for him. You know, maybe the coalition are getting a bit overconfident at this point, you know, they've just, they've already beaten Napoleon essentially twice, you know, once in Russia, 
and once at like you know and again at Leipzig and you know his greatest defeat ever he's lost Spain to Wellington and the Spanish and the Portuguese and you know there are two coalition axes of advance now onto French soil you know, you've got Wellington and uh, invading France in the south and you've also got the coalition armies invading across the Rhine as well and they've just beaten Napoleon on French soil so maybe they're getting a bit cocky After two days to reorganize, Napoleon continued his retreat to Nogent, where he learned that the Allies had split their armies. Not only that, they were advancing at different speeds, the aggressive Blücher racing ahead, while the more cautious Schwarzenberg lagged behind. Leaving Oudinot and Victor to guard the Seine bridges and delay Schwarzenberg, Napoleon raced north through mud and rain with 30,000 men. The army of Silesia was strung out on the march, oblivious to the danger it was in. First, Napoleon fell on General Osufiev's Russian 9th Corps at Champaubert, destroying it, taking its commander and 2,000 men prisoner. The next morning, he marched on General Austin Sacken's force near Montmiral. This was a much larger force, with two infantry and one cavalry corps, and was expecting support from York's Prussian 1st Corps. But the Prussians were late, and Sacken's troops could not withstand the French onslaught. At this desperate hour, the Emperor's elite Old Guard were no longer held back, but were often thrown into the thick of the fighting. By the end of the day, Napoleon had inflicted another 3,500 casualties, twice his own losses, and the Allies were in rapid retreat. Napoleon had ordered Marshal Macdonald to cut off the enemy's escape by seizing the Marne Bridge at Chateau Thierry. But York's Prussians got there first. The next day, Napoleon could only batter their rear guard as the enemy fled across the Marne, destroying the bridge behind them. Sending Marshal Mortier to rebuild the bridge and continue the pursuit, Napoleon doubled back to rejoin Marmont, who had been left to keep watch on Blücher. Napoleon attacked at Vauchamp, using General Grouchy's cavalry to outflank Blücher's army, which was soon in headlong retreat. A merciless French pursuit inflicted 6,000 Prussian and Russian casualties. Napoleon lost just 600 men. Napoleon had taken on an enemy army almost twice his size, and beaten it four times in just six days. Blücher had lost an estimated 15,000 casualties in battle, and another 15,000 in smaller engagements, as stragglers or deserters. For Look at that, that's nearly a 10 to 1 casualty ratio. You know, that's... And to con you know to think that Napoleon did this with essentially you know, obviously some of his troops are going to be veterans, but a lot of them are conscripts. That just shows the kind of man that they were facing. But now the army of Silesia had been scattered and neutralized. But in the south, Marshals Victor and Udino had not been able to prevent Schwarzenberg's army of Bohemia from crossing the Seine in three places. Austrian troops were now just 40 miles from Paris. This here shows the, the problem that Napoleon was facing because he might be able to score victories in the short term. But are these victories really going to change anything in the long term? No, because what's happening? You know, he's... Schwarzenberg's army is much larger. You know, that was well over 200,000 men. So he goes for Blücher's army, which is the smaller one. But again, because it's strung out, he's able to attack individual isolated units and sort of throw them into disarray. But now that's given Schwar uh, Schwarzenberg time to cross um, 
the rivers here and get across and threaten Paris. And now he's Napoleon is going to have to come down and deal with uh, Schwarzenberg. But then what's going to happen? Blücher, his army is still intact. It's you know it's been battered, but it's still in one piece. He's going to reorganize and continue his march, which means then if Napoleon can deal with Schwarzenberg down here, he's going to have to march back up again, deal with Blücher, which means then Schwarzenberg has time to move even closer to Paris. So it's this kind of like ebb and flow. Um, so no matter how many, and bearing in mind Napoleon's vastly outnumbered at this point, so the more casualties that he takes, the worse off he gets. You know, he doesn't have numerical superiority anymore. So that's showing the problems that he was facing with this campaign. Still a brilliant campaign by any measure, but um, no matter how many victories he scores, he's not going to win the campaign overall. Leaving Mortier and Marmont to keep watch on Blücher, Napoleon raced south. Schwarzenberg, alarmed by news of Blücher's defeat and of Napoleon's approach, immediately ordered a retreat. It was too late for Wittgenstein's advance guard, routed at Mormain with 2,000 casualties. Napoleon sent Victor's second corps to seize the bridge at Montereau, but was so infuriated by its slow progress that he sacked Victor and gave his corps to General Gérard. The next day, at the Battle of Montereau, the French drove the Allied Württemberg Corps back across the river, with 30% losses. According to some accounts, the Emperor sighted the French cannon himself, as he had at Lodi 18 years before. Again, things like that. Um, those stories are actually considered apocryphal, particularly the one that happened 18 years previous. It's very likely that he didn't personally cite the cannon or anything like that, but that's, again, because even though it didn't happen, or even if it's very likely it didn't happen, it doesn't matter, because it still tells us something about the psychology of the people writing it, which is that they viewed Napoleon as this kind of larger-than-life figure who inspired so much confidence in the troops that he led. You know, because the idea of, you know, the general, you know, kind of quote-unquote debasing himself by mingling among the common soldiers and sighting the guns by himself when he doesn't have to do any of that, you know, it's kind of a testament to, you know, look how good a leader he is. And that's kind of the point, you know, it doesn't matter whether he sighted the guns personally or not, because that tells us something about how his troops viewed him. Napoleon had the Allies on the run. But how long could it last? Even as fighting continued, negotiations between France and the coalition reopened at Châtillon-sur-Seine on the 5th of February. The Allied terms were now more severe. A return to France's frontiers of 1791, which meant the additional loss of Belgium, a humiliation that Napoleon refused to accept. Instead, he tried to revive the Frankfurt proposals, hoping to play for time and to split the coalition, whose war aims varied from Britain's hard line to Austria's more ambiguous position. But this hope was thwarted by British Foreign Secretary Lord Castlereagh. On the 1st of March, he persuaded the Allies to sign the Treaty of Chaumont. In it, Russia, Prussia, Austria and Great Britain agreed to keep 150,000 troops in the field and not to negotiate separately with France, while Britain added the sweetener of a £5 million subsidy to be shared among the Allies. The treaty's secret articles specified common war aims, including the future independence of the German states, Switzerland and Italy, while Spain was to be returned to the Bourbons and Holland to the House of Orange. The four powers even agreed that once they'd defeated Napoleon, they'd form a 20-year defensive alliance to maintain peace in Europe, a sign of their newfound commitment to each other. 
A split in the coalition had been Napoleon's last, best hope for a favourable peace. That was gone. I that kind of plays into what I was saying earlier, that opening negotiations, it's not always about getting a peace. You know, it's not about necessarily ending the conflict, it's about scoring a diplomatic victory. You know, it's about trying to kind of split your enemies up, you know, or throw them off balance, and that's kind of what Napoleon was hoping for here. But as we see, it didn't work. And news from across the country was bleak. French cities were surrendering to the Allies without a fight. Nancy, Dijon and Macon had all fallen. In the south, Wellington defeated Marshal Soult at Ortez, forcing him to fall back on Toulouse. Two weeks later, as British troops approached the city of Bordeaux, it declared loyalty to France's Bourbon kings. The mayor himself rode out to greet the British, bearing a white cockade, the sign of Bourbon allegiance. Napoleon's hope for a nation in arms to resist the Allies had not materialised. Allied troops, particularly Cossacks, often robbed French civilians and committed some atrocities. French peasants took revenge when they could, but there was no guerrilla war to mirror what French troops had encountered in Spain or Russia. The chief desire among ordinary French people was for peace. Yeah, and that's to be expected because they've had the better part of two decades of just constant fighting. You know, they initiated the revolution precisely because they were impoverished. You know, they had they were being bled dry by the Bourbon monarchy. Um, you know, they were suffering incredibly under heel of the um estab you know, the sort of established social order of the day. Here comes the revolution and then Napoleon promising stability and, and, and whatnot and reform and things like that. And while he did bring a lot of that initially to France, the constant fighting just completely exhausted the French people's will to continue because, you know, they're, they're having to pay through the nose for these wars, you know, for one thing. Um, a lot of their you know, a lot of the young men in these communities will have gone off to fight and many would have died. You know, these communities would have lost a lot of people, so they would have been personally impacted by the war. And now coalition armies are on their soil. They just want this to end. At almost any price. That's an interesting quote because it's basically saying that Napoleon was deluding himself to the danger that was around him. Because that's that's interesting, you know, um, particularly that. But he sought to escape from them by misrepresenting them to himself. In other words, he's trying to convince himself that it's not as bad as it seems. Any talk of Napoleon's defeat in late February was premature. The French emperor was driving Schwarzenberg's army of Bohemia before him even though it was twice his size. But Schwarzenberg scrambled to safety behind the River Ob. Napoleon knew he had to land another decisive blow soon, so turned his attention back to Blücher. After an aborted attempt to join forces with Schwarzenberg, Blücher had decided to resume his advance on Paris gathering reinforcements en route, and with only Marmont and Mortier's weak corps to oppose him. Leaving Marshal Macdonald in command in the south, Napoleon set off to intercept Blücher, covering 60 miles in three days along terrible roads choked with mud. At Napoleon's approach, Blücher retreated across the Marne, burning the bridges behind him. 24 hours later, they'd been rebuilt by French engineers, and Napoleon was poised to crush Blücher against the Erne River, because the major crossing point at Soissons was held by a Franco-Polish garrison. But after just a day's fighting, the garrison commander at Soissons tamely surrendered, allowing Blücher to escape.
Napoleon continued his pursuit across the Aisne, still hoping to cut off the army of Silesia. But at Craon, he encountered Russian troops in a strong defensive position. The Russians fought stubbornly. The French finally forced the enemy to withdraw, but only at the cost of 6,000 casualties, including many irreplaceable veterans from Napoleon's guard. Napoleon pushed on to Long. But by now, Blücher had concentrated his forces, 98,000 troops in all, and outnumbered Napoleon two to one. French attacks were repulsed, while Marmont's corps was caught off guard by a late Allied counterattack and routed. Napoleon was lucky to avoid a much heavier defeat. Blücher, usually aggressive to the point of recklessness, was unwell and had been told Napoleon's army was twice as big as it was, leading him to act with unusual caution. Long was a heavy blow to Napoleon. Six and a half thousand casualties he could not afford. Undaunted, he fell back to Soissons, and after a brief moment to reorganize, he marched on the city of Reims, which had just fallen to Saint-Priest's Russian corps. In a whirlwind assault, Napoleon retook the city. Saint-Priest himself was mortally wounded, his corps routed. Meanwhile, in the south, Schwarzenberg had resumed his offensive as soon as he found out Napoleon had gone north. That's what I mean. So, you know, Napoleon, Napoleon can only be in one place at one time, but he's facing two different fronts. So he's having to sort of, you know, almost like, fro you know, uh, leapfrog between them. Um, but he goes to one and deals with one, the other advances. You know, he goes to deal with them, the other one advances. So, you know, he can only contain them for so long. You know, it's, at this point, it's just kind of delaying the inevitable. But the fact that he's putting up such an incredible fight, you know, that's just a testament to the kind of leadership ability that he had. Um, but it's good, you know, it's interesting to see Blücher retreat ahead of him rather than be so aggressive. You know, he's remembering the rule, try not to engage Napoleon in direct combat unless you have like a decisive advantage, which he was trying to do by concentrating all his troops. In heavy fighting, he'd driven Oudinot and Macdonald back from the River Ope. Five days later, the Allies had recaptured Troyes, as Macdonald retreated behind the River Seine. Now, after four days to rest and reorganize his battered army, Napoleon was coming south once more. Schwarzenberg, emboldened by news of Napoleon's defeat at Laon, decided that this time he would stand and fight. Napoleon advanced on Arcis sur Eube, ignoring reports that the enemy was not retreating as he believed, but gathering for battle. As heavy fighting broke out, Napoleon still believed he faced only the enemy rearguard. It was a nasty surprise to discover that he faced the entire might of the Army of Bohemia. 28,000 men against 80,000. In desperate fighting, Napoleon personally rallied fleeing troops and exposed himself to enemy fire, having his horse killed under him by an exploding shell. But the odds were too great. At the end of the second day, Napoleon was forced to order the retreat. Keep in mind that a lot of his troops, remember, are conscripts. So the fact that he's putting up a fight this intense, that says something.
I think as well, that's certainly how Napoleon would have preferred to, to go out as well. You know, he probably would have preferred to go out in a blaze of glory rather than having, rather than being alive to see everything that he had achieved in his mind be kind of ripped away from him. So I think if he had probably fallen in battle, especially defending French home soil, he probably would have been pretty happy. Napoleon believed his army was now too weak to take on the Allies directly, so he decided to change strategy. He would march into the rear of the Allied armies, join up with some of his isolated garrisons, and cut the enemy's lines of communication, forcing them to abandon their advance on Paris. But the Allies, until now always one step behind Napoleon, had just received crucial information. Talleyrand, the most brilliant French diplomat of the age, and the most slippery. He'd served France's monarchy, the Revolution, then Napoleon, until in 1807 he fell out irrevocably with the Emperor over foreign policy. He now believed that Napoleon was dragging France into ruin and worked behind the scenes to ensure his downfall. From he kind of reminds me, if anyone's read A Song of Ice and Fire or watched Game of Thrones, he kind of reminds me of Varys a little bit. You know, he's not someone who's particularly loyal to a dynasty, but he's loyal to the idea of a country. So, you know, you could kind of argue that Talleyrand is perhaps loyal to France. He's not loyal to the Bourbons. He's not loyal to... Um, Napoleon, he's not loyal to the revolution, he's just loyal to France, and what, you know, whatever is best for France is what he will pursue, you know, regardless of whether that means him betraying um, at one faction or another. From Paris, he wrote to the Russian Emperor Alexander at Allied headquarters, informing him that in the capital, support for Napoleon was crumbling, and the city's defences had been completely neglected. He urged the Allies to march immediately on Paris, without allowing Napoleon to distract them. Talleyrand's information was confirmed when the Allies intercepted a report from Napoleon's chief of police, General Savary, meant for the Emperor. The treasury, arsenals and powder stores are empty. We are completely at the end of our resources. The population is discouraged and discontented wishing peace at any price. As Napoleon advanced on Saint-Dizier, the Allies sent General Witzingerode and 10,000 cavalry to harass his army and to screen their own movements. Then began their march on Paris. At Fer Champenoise, they collided with Marmont and Mortier's corps advancing to join Napoleon. An entire National Guard division, 5,000 men, was virtually wiped out as the marshals suffered a crushing defeat. Napoleon feared that the fall of Paris would be a fatal blow to his regime. His political authority and ability to wage war might not recover. So when he received news of the Allies' movements, he tore up his plans and ordered a forced march back to Paris, intending to lead its defence in person. Napoleon's wife and son were evacuated from the capital, along with most of his ministers. His brother, Joseph, the ex-King of Spain, was in charge of the city's defences, but had done little. Paris was awash with rumours of treachery and defeat. Marmont and Mortier were able to reach Paris before the Allies, adding their troops to the garrison. It now totaled 37,000 men, including some hardened veterans of the Guard, but many more young conscripts, while a third were part-time soldiers of the National Guard. 
The Allies had 120,000 seasoned troops outside the city. And given the urgency of taking Paris before Napoleon could intervene, their elite guards and grenadier divisions would lead the way. On the 30th of March, they began their assault from the north. Heavy fighting raged throughout the day. The city's defenders fought bravely, inflicting several thousand casualties on the advancing enemy. But defeat was inevitable. That night, to save Paris from destruction, Marshal Marmont agreed to surrender the city, on condition the garrison was permitted to leave with its weapons. At the Hôtel des Invalides, the 71-year-old Marshal Serrurier oversaw the burning of 1,400 flags and standards captured from France's enemies, as well as Frederick the Great's sword and sash, so they would not fall into Allied hands. Napoleon was just 15 miles from Paris when he was informed of the city's surrender. He sat with his head in his hands for 15 minutes. That right there as well, that shows what kind of position the two sides were in, because you remember when Napoleon invades Russia, the Russians were perfectly comfortable with just leaving Moscow and burning it to the ground, to deny it to the enemy, and to deny them cover and deny them supplies and to starve them to death and force them to retreat, which worked. Moscow wasn't the capital, remember, that was moved to St. Petersburg. So it wasn't quite the same effect necessarily of um, losing Paris, because Paris was the capital, it was the historic capital, as well as the current capital, you know, it's not like it had been, uh, it's not like the capital had been changed to another city, say like Orléans or something, you know, or uh, Caen or whatever, you know, um, it doesn't have that kind of same, you know, there's still a, a very big psychological impact with how symbolic the city of Moscow was, but remember there was the Battle of Borodino before it, so, you know, they could say that they at least fought for it and tried to fight for it, and when the enemy captured it, they would rather destroy it than let it fall into enemy hands. But here, it's interesting that the French are in such kind of, they're just kind of sick of this now at this point, you know, his marshals are, are pretty much all deserting him. I think the only one that really stays is Ney, to an extent. You know, he stays with him right through the Battle of Waterloo, for example. But I mean, most others, they're trying to cut deals with the Allies to keep their positions of power. Um, and others, they're just kind of getting to this point where they're saying, look, it's over, just let it go. You know, just stop, because you're going to ruin France as a country. And it's interesting here that they're saying, look, when, you know, the Russians burnt Moscow to the ground rather than let it fall into our hands. But we're not going to do the same with Paris. You know, we would rather save the city than destroy it. You know, we'd rather have the city in one piece and hand it to the enemy and just end this bloody war rather than destroy it and try to keep fighting when we know the writing's on the wall and it's over. So that's an interesting um, quote there from MacDonald, particularly how fierce MacDonald was fighting as well. On the 31st of March, 1814, France's enemies marched into Paris for the first time since the Hundred Years' War. Parisian crowds cheered the three allied monarchs, bringers of peace. Everyone in Paris was suddenly a royalist once more. Above all, they cheered for Emperor Alexander of Russia, now hailed as Europe's saviour. Don Cossacks bivouacked on the Champs-Élysées. Allied troops generally behaved well. Thirty-five miles away, Napoleon was at Fontainebleau, with 36,000 men 
all of them hungry and exhausted after their hundred-mile forced march. Nevertheless, Napoleon began planning an immediate advance on Paris. But for the first time, he faced unanimous opposition from his ministers and marshals, including Ney, Macdonald, Oudinot and Berthier. They reminded him of his oath to act for the good of France. He accused them of disloyalty, acting only to save themselves. They told him the war was lost, and he must abdicate in favour of his son if possible. On the 4th of April, Marshal Marmont surrendered his entire corps to the coalition, which was marched over to the enemy lines against the wishes of many of its officers and men. This was a devastating blow to Napoleon, and encouraged the Allies to reject his offer of a conditional abdication in favour of his son. Two days later, he abdicated without conditions. The Allied powers having proclaimed that the Emperor Napoleon is the only obstacle to the re-establishment of peace in Europe, the Emperor Napoleon, faithful to his oath, declares that he renounces, for himself and his heirs, the thrones of France and Italy, and that there is no personal sacrifice, including his life, that he is not ready to make in the interests of France. Napoleon's abdication was formalised by the Treaty of Fontainebleau, by which he was allowed to keep the title of Emperor, become sovereign of the small island of Elba, and retain a bodyguard of 400 men. News came too late to prevent Wellington's attack on Toulouse, leading to a costly and pointless battle, with more than 7,000 casualties. The night after his abdication, Napoleon tried to commit suicide, using the poison that had been made for him in Russia, in case of capture. But it had lost its potency, and he survived. Two weeks later, Napoleon bade farewell to his old guard at Fontainebleau Palace, and began his journey into exile. That's interesting, because you remember in other instances I was saying Napoleon was kind of a bit like Caesar, in that he never seemed to be able to take full personal responsibility. You know, it, it was worded in such a way where he was maybe appearing to, to do so, but the careful wording of how he did it was sort of like shifting blame onto other people, and on, onto, you know, other factors. You know, like when... Um, I think I think it was the invasion of Russia. He said something like, "Fortune has led me astray." You know, as in, "Oh, it's not my fault." You know that I completely miscalculated. I was led astray by otherworldly forces. You know, but here, this this is interesting because now that everything has been taken away from him, it seems like he's got like a, a pang of humility there. You know, he's thinking, "You know, I have done a lot of wrong." Um, he like that. I have done harm in war. You know, he's kind of acknowledging that, you know, mm, you know, maybe everything I did, you know, it has brought so much death and destruction. You know, it's kind of, it's kind of almost like a glimmer of understanding of why Europe turned against him, and um, and particularly saying I have been wrong maybe in my plans. You know, he's kind of admitting that to himself that you know maybe this all came apart because of me. So that's interesting. The Napoleonic Wars, which had raged on land and sea for 11 years, seemed finally at an end. The death toll is unknown, but historians estimate that two to three million lives were lost across Europe. Most soldiers died not in battle, but from disease. Many thousands were left maimed and disfigured. For most of this period, Napoleon was master of Europe, imposing treaties on humbled enemies, 
redrawing frontiers, overthrowing old regimes, and making new kings. He was the last figure in history to combine total political power with frontline military genius, in the mould of Alexander and Caesar. But it seemed Napoleon's reign was to end in abject military defeat. However, exile on Elba did not prove to Napoleon's taste. In less than 10 months, he would return to France to fight one last great campaign to reclaim his throne. Which we will take a look at next time, which will no doubt be the video on the Battle of Waterloo. So, again, another fantastic video here by Epic History TV. So we're um, pretty much at the end of this series now, um, but we've got a couple more to do. We've got the Battle of Waterloo, and then we've got the video on Napoleon's Marshals as well. So, um, or at least the videos on Napoleon's Marshals. I believe there's actually quite a few of them, so that should be interesting, uh, which a few of you have requested. So uh, keep an eye out for that. But in the meantime, thank you all so much for watching, and I shall see you all on the next one. Thank you.